Good morning, Victory. I want to welcome you out today. If it's your first time, we're so glad to have you with us this morning. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. We're glad to have you with us digitally from wherever you are, whatever couch you're currently sitting on. Thanks for joining us. Uh, how do you guys feel uh, being at church, losing an hour of sleep? Are we doing okay? I just want to let you guys know, like, if you fall asleep during my message, like, I will know it's not because I'm boring, but because you guys are just tired, right? <laughs> Um, I'm really, really glad that you guys are here today. Today, we're going to be talking about sacrifice and how appropriate, considering that you guys sacrificed an extra hour of sleep to get here this morning. So hats off to you guys. You could have easily come in second service, but you guys are here early. God bless you. You guys are going to beat the lunch crowd. Thanks. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about sacrifice. And how many guys you were here last week? You were here last week. Last week, I had a lot of people come up, and I preached about not giving, uh, not giving up. And a lot of people were like, wow, that was so inspirational to us. It was so helpful. It was so encouraging. Well, today, I'm not going to encourage you. I'm going to make you mad. Um, so I, I buttered you up with the last one, and then this one, like you guys, are just not going to like me very much, and I'm okay with that. Um, but we're going to talk about sacrifice this morning, and, and to illustrate it, I want to I want to share an example that I think is pretty fitting. How many have ever seen the movie Office Space? Anybody? Let's see, let's see some hands. Uh, you guys are Christians. What are you doing watching that movie? Just kidding. There's, there's, uh, there's a part in that movie where uh, there's this uh, character played by Jennifer Aniston, and she works in a restaurant. And in that restaurant, they require them to wear badges, and they call the badges flair. And the badges say things like, you know, try the enchiladas or, you know, smile or whatever. And they have like, you know, happy faces and stars and all this stuff. And Jennifer Aniston's character in this movie just is not interested in wearing the flair. Anybody you have things that you have to do at your job and it's just not for you and you like catch an attitude about it? <laughs> okay, like there's things <laughs> that we have to do with it. You guys are all smiling like really, really big. So some of you guys need new jobs. You guys are like, oh, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but she, this was something she just couldn't stand, you know? She just, just hated it. I used to work at Office Depot, and working in retail or, or in the service industry, you kind of tend to come across things that you don't want to do. And when I worked at Office Depot, they told us that we had to sell an accessory with everything that somebody bought. So if somebody bought a printer, they had to leave with paper. If somebody bought a, a, a desk, they had to leave with a chair, and so on. And I, I hated doing that because I felt like I was always trying to, like, milk people for money, and I always had a bad attitude about it, you know? And so Jennifer Aniston's character in this movie, she has to wear pieces of flair, and she doesn't want to do it. And so the manager makes a rule. He says, you have to wear a minimum of four pieces of flair. And so she comes to work with how many pieces of flair? Four pieces of flair. She comes to work wearing what is required of her, no more, no less. And the boss looks at her, and he says, listen, you're not wearing enough flair today. She said, what are you talking about? I'm wearing the four pieces that are required of me. He said, well, I want you to look at Toby over there. And he points over at the worker. Like, we all know this worker, the person that shows up like they have something to prove. You know what I mean? And they come up, and, like, they're just always kissing up to the boss. And you're like, did somebody leave the vacuum on? Because I hear a loud sucking noise right now, okay? And there's always kissing up to the boss, Right? And this guy is just wearing all kinds of flair. He's got his just shirt covered with badges and all this stuff. And he's just like, hey, can I take your order? Welcome to, you know, just like the kind of person you just want to slap and be like, why are you this happy? And the boss points and says, see, I, I want you to be more like him. And she's like, well, I don't understand what the problem is. I am wearing what's required of me. He said, yes, but you're wearing the bare minimum and he's going above and beyond. And the reason why I wanted to share that example is because I think as Christians, a lot of times, we come to God with our bare minimum as well. Are you with me? We read the Bible, we search the scriptures, we find out what's the least amount of flair that I have to bring before God in order to qualify for heaven, and I'm gonna do that. Are you with me this morning? You know what I'm talking about. Can I get an amen? amen. Can, I get a, can I get a that's me? <laughs> People are like, I'm not admitting to that. Absolutely not. But we come before God bringing our bare minimum. We come before God doing the least amount possible. And I believe, church, that God has called us to a journey that will take us above and beyond. And God's roadmap for our life does not include the bare minimum. 
God's roadmap for our life requires us to take a journey and a path that is going to be more than anything that we in our natural mind would want to submit to. But God is saying, I am calling you out of the bare minimum. Are you listening to me this morning? God has called us to possess a sacrifice mentality in a bare minimum reality. Are you with me? See, we live in a world where everybody just wants to do the least amount possible. Any of y'all have kids? Anybody ever tell your kids to clean their room? Now, they might clean their room, but they're not vacuuming. Am I right? Are you with me? If you say, I want you to take care of your clothes on the floor, they're putting it in the laundry basket, but they're not washing them. Are you with me? We live in a bare minimum reality. Any folks in here married? Should I go there? Honey, can you take care of the dishes? You know what that means? They're off the table. That's what you get. Maybe they're in the trash. You're like, honey, these are glass. I don't know. (laughs) You said get them off the table. We live in a bare minimum reality, and God has called us to have a sacrifice mentality in a bare minimum reality. The world is constantly trying to influence us to do the least amount possible that's required of us. And God is saying, no, I want you to give me everything. I'm looking for total surrender. I'm looking for total sacrifice. I'm looking for you to literally lay your life down for me. Are you with me, church? We're going to pray this morning because I want you guys to be able to receive what God is going to be speaking to us today. So can you guys join with me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for your word that's alive, that's active that is sharper than any two-edged sword, Father God, that pierces through our flesh, God, and gets to the bone. And God, this morning, I pray that your word is like a scalpel that does its work and cuts away anything that's not of you, God, so that we might have more of you and less of ourselves, that the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and speaks to our minds, God, that the Holy Spirit comes upon me, anoints my words, and empowers the words that I speak, Father God, to do the work that you would have them to do, Father, that they find fertile soil in hearts this morning and that lives are changed and that we can truly bring a sacrifice to you that is worthy of your name and all that you've done for us in Jesus. Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Turn your Bibles with me this morning. How many folks brought their Bibles? If you have a Bible, I want you to hold it up really high. Let me see it. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, sinner. Okay, don't do that. I always test you guys every Sunday and you fail. But Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. When you're there, say hallelujah in your best media voice. It says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, how many people want to be disciples of Christ this morning? Let me see some hands. Say, that's me. Whoever wants to be my disciple, get ready, some instructions are coming up, must deny themselves. Must deny themselves. In other words, must sacrifice their desires must sacrifice their ambitions, must lay themselves down for God, denying yourself. That means every time God tells you to do something and your flesh says no, you reject your flesh and follow Christ. If you want to be a disciple of God, see, a lot of us, we get it confused. We think that being a disciple of God means just reading the Bible or just going to church. No, if you want to be a disciple of God, you've got to deny yourself because God knows your flesh, because God knows what you really want The Bible says that we follow our hearts and our hearts are exceedingly wicked. And so God says, I want you to deny those things. I want you to deny the greed. I want you to deny the jealousy. I want you to deny the ambition and the pride and and the lust and all these things. If you want to be my disciple, how many want to be his disciple this morning? Let me see some hands. You've got to deny yourself. Look at somebody next to you with their hand up and say, deny yourself. And again... He is calling us to a sacrifice mentality in a bare minimum reality. God says to deny yourself. The world says to treat yourself. Are you with me? God says deny yourself. The world says treat yourself. God's saying, no, I want you to deny yourself. It says this, and take up their cross and follow me. What does the cross represent, church? The cross represents death. Are you with me? The cross wasn't an instrument of joy, was it? The cross wasn't an instrument of fun. It wasn't an instrument of satisfaction. The cross was an instrument of death. 
And what Jesus is saying is you've got to sacrifice your will to live, and you've got to be prepared to take up a cross and put your flesh on it and die. Elsewhere in the Bible, uh, the apostle writes, for I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. I took up my cross and I nailed my flesh to that cross. I sacrificed myself. I denied myself. And now Christ is alive through me. That's the roadmap that God is calling us to. Right elsewhere in the book of Matthew, it says, if they're not willing to take up their cross, they cannot be my disciples. If you're not willing to die, if you're not willing to deny yourself, I have news for you this morning. The Bible says you can't belong to God. You can't. That's a heavy statement, isn't it? Because a lot of times we think, if I can just be a good person, then God will accept me. It's not about you being good. It's about you dying. It's not about you doing the right things. It's about you surrendering yourself to God and saying, God, I'm doing nothing. It's all about what you want to do through me. I'm yours. I'm yours. My thoughts are yours. My desires are are yours. My values are yours. My opinions are yours. God, take control. Take everything. The dictionary defines sacrifice as the act of offering to God something Precious. Everybody say precious. precious. Particularly a life laid on an altar. The act of offering God something precious. See, a lot of times we try to bring God things that are of little value. Amen? Hey, God, I showed up to church on Sunday, and we had time change, and it was a sacrifice. You're welcome. Is that precious? Is that precious or is that the bare minimum? It's like, God, I gave up an extra hour of sleep for you. He's like, I gave up my son for you. There's a broad chasm between the life of Jesus and your hour of lost sleep. Sacrifice is the act of bringing God something precious. But let's be perfectly honest. In America, we prefer to live in safety instead of living in sacrifice. We prefer to live in safety instead of living in sacrifice. And we are comfortable with contributions, but not with surrender. Jesus wants it all. He doesn't want your contribution, he wants your surrender. And when the offering basket comes around and you open up your wallet and you start leafing through for what bill you feel comfortable with depositing into the basket, there's not a bill in there that is gonna satisfy God because he just wants you to put your wallet in. Metaphorically speaking, are you with me? He wants you to just be like, God, what do you, what do you, God, what do you want here? You want all of it here? Take it. Take my, my Michael Kors purse. It's yours. I don't want it. I'm not going to hold on to it anymore. God, it all belongs. That, that I have it is a blessing from you. So God, take all of it. But we trick ourselves and convince ourselves that I have contributed, so therefore I have sacrificed. And God's like, that's not a sacrifice because it's not precious. Are you with me? Went to church uh, several years ago, and there was this older lady that would come in, and for years, every single service, she would put a dollar into the offering. A dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar. It doesn't matter if it was revival. We had 10 services in a week, a dollar was going in. Doesn't matter we had one service, a dollar was going in. And for me, I don't really know, I was a lot younger, I don't know that lady's story, but for me, that appears more to me like a contribution or a habit than it does as a sacrifice. Are you with me? Like, God, what, what can I, and, I'm, and it's not the dollar amount, are you with me? There's a story in the Bible where uh, this, this, uh, this, this rich man gives a giant offering, but it's out of his excess, and then a poor lady comes in and she gives just pennies, but that's all that she had. And Jesus said, which one is more pleasing, the giant offering that came from somebody's excess or the small offering that came from somebody's lack? It's not the dollar amount. It's not, it's not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. Are you with me, church? Jesus wants it all. Jesus wants it all, but we're always looking for reasons why we're not obligated to give him everything. And it's a fight sometimes. And if, can I be real as a pastor for a second? As, am I welcome to do that in this church? 
<laughs> I was going to do it whether you guys said yes or no, because I'm just, uh, it's in my notes, so I'm going there. But better if you guys are on the same page with me. There's, there's a lot of times as a pastor, as a leader, where it's almost dreadful to have to ask the congregation for something. I just went to a, a leadership conference with some of the church staff, and it was in Bradenton, and I went to several, they had breakout sessions for pastors, and I went to several breakout sessions for pastors, and they gave pastors the opportunity to ask questions. The number one question that every pastor asked was, how do I get my people to give? How do I get my people to give? All the pastors talked about was this is how you get your people to give. This is how you get them to serve. This is how you get them to participate. It was all about just getting the church to do the things that the church should just desire to do because they're redeemed by the blood of Jesus and their life is saved for eternity. And sometimes, man, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Sometimes, like, we'll have a project we're working on at church. I'm like, hey, can we get somebody to come and help paint for four or five hours? And it's like nobody comments. And, and that's not to devalue the people that have helped because there have been projects that have been done at this church that, let's, I'm gonna be perfectly honest, wouldn't have got done without people stepping up and sacrificing their time. And I'm grateful for that. But there's a lot of resistance at the same time. And for every 10 people that show up and help, there's 100 people that just turn and look the other way. And I've had people ask these or questions or say these things before. I've, I've had people like, message me or come to me personally and say, why are you always asking for people to help you with stuff at the church? I'm like, listen, it's not for me, it's for God. Amen? Amen? Yeah. If you come in and you help me paint that back wall, like, that's not at my house. Yeah. Are you with me? Like, I still gotta go home and take care of stuff at my home. That's for me. You come to my house and you cut my grass, that's for Daniel. If you come to church and you do something at the church, that's for God. And if you see it as something for me, it's not going to be sustainable and you're not going to make it in your Christian walk because everything that somebody asks you to do as a sacrifice, you're looking at as a sacrifice to man. And I'm not worthy of your sacrifice, but God is. Amen. I've had people say, you know what? You ask people to come and help a lot at church. Why don't you ever offer to pay people to come and help? I'm like... Number one, you guys don't tithe enough for that. <laughs> Maybe if you tithe a little bit more, I'd just be like, hey, you want to paint the church? I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> for another thing, I always have this question, because I get that, I've actually got that question a lot, and I, I always wonder, do you feel that God has done so little for you that you deserve compensation in addition to salvation? Do you believe that God has done so little for you that you deserve compensation in addition to salvation? Some of you guys are like, I don't like that he repeated that twice. <laughs> Once was more than enough. Are you listening? Are you seeing how this mentality is cancerous? This is a bare minimum mentality, and God has called us to a sacrificial reality. But because we're so in our flesh, we're looking at it saying, what can I get out of it? And I look around at modern Christianity, and I see an incredible lack of sacrifice. I look at the, you guys ever look at the Christians in the Old Testament and the stuff that they did for God? Yo, they faced lions. Emperor Nero of Rome literally had so many Christians that he would soak them in oil, hang them on posts, and light them on fire as street lights to illuminate the city of Rome. And we can't fast. We can't fast. You know what's funny, man, is... Um, I've, I've talked to people about like, hey, let's do a fast or this or that. And people are like, I can't go without eating. And think about it. When somebody talks about fasting, you're like, I could fast Facebook. I could do that. That's doable for me. That's not a sacrifice. That's a contribution. Are you with me? Fasting, you say. So that means, okay, so we're fasting for a day. That means skipping breakfast and lunch, but I can have dinner. Hmm. 
Okay. Daniel fast, I can eat, I can eat green things. Okay, maybe, maybe we could work that one out. Wait, can I have smoothies? Do smoothies count? Are you with me? I, I want to ask you an honest question. This is, I don't want you to answer verbally. I want you to answer mentally. When was the last time you fasted? When was the last time you fasted? You know what's funny, man? I just, I, I just personally did a, a seven-day fast just a, a couple weeks ago, and I can't remember the last time I did one for seven days. And I felt so good about myself too, right? You know, you ever do something for God and you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. I just did a seven-day fast. And you kind of want to tell people, but you know you shouldn't. And I was like feeling so good about myself. And then I was reading an article about this uh, church in, uh, in, in South America. I think it was in, oh, man, it was in like Peru or Brazil or something like that. And they have a youth group of 400 kids and they did a 30-day water-only fast. The youth group. And I'm feeling good about myself for my seven days. Where's our sacrifice? Where's our sacrifice? When was the last time you prayed? I mean, really prayed. I mean, really prayed. I'm not talking about, thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it to our body's nourishment. Amen. Neutralize the calories. <laughs> Those are good prayers, by the way. When was the last time you really prayed? When was the last time you got on your face before God? It's an uncomfortable message, am I right? When was the last time you prayed? Do you actually study the word of God? Do you study it? Or do you have like a daily devotional calendar and you peel it off and read your verse for the day as a pick-me-up for your flesh? Or are you studying the word of God to learn more about your Savior? because you want him to speak to you and you want him to change you and you want him to kill your flesh. When was the last time you witnessed to anybody about your faith? We all go to work. We all go to school. We all go to the supermarket. We have opportunity. When was the last time you sacrificed your dignity for the sake of eternity? There's no relationship without sacrifice. Am I right? Anybody ever been in like a relationship before you ever dated somebody, married, whatever? Like, it doesn't feel good when the other person's not willing to sacrifice anything for you. Am I right? Yeah, me and Ashley, like, I, 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 God bless her, but like, dude, like, I don't know what kind of a picture I paint for that woman because I am so cheap. <laughs> I am so cheap. Like, if we go to Outback with the family, we are going through McDonald's first, and the kids are coming in with dollar chicken nuggets. <laughs> I don't care about the optics. I don't care what people think. I'm not buying a meal for my kids at Outback. You guys don't appreciate quality. You guys are having no kids. <laughs> I was thinking about this time where Ashley and I, we had just gotten married. We were like six months into our marriage, the time when you're on your best behavior, Right? And we're coming back from Fiji, and we, uh, we have our flight in, in Hawaii is, like, canceled due to weather or something like that. And so we were stuck in Hawaii for a night. Like, how many guys would like to be stuck in Hawaii for a night? Right? And I'm there, like, all right, so uh, we're just going to sleep in the, ho uh, the airport, you know? Like, uh, there's a good – she's like, why don't we get a hotel? I'm like, baby, hotels cost money. <laughs> and she's like, I really want to sleep in a bed tonight. And I'm like, ah, you're high maintenance. And then I'm looking for, like, the cheapest hotel I can find. Like, Motel 6 is, like, that's just, I'm not ready for that kind of cheddar. You know what I mean? And I'm looking, and I literally spent probably about an hour looking for a cheap hotel. And finally, Ashley looks at me, and she's like, you're getting me a hotel, and you're getting it right now because I am tired, and I want to go to bed. And you need to stop worrying about saving a nickel. Yeah. And it was like a light clicked for me. And I was like, I should be taking care of my wife right now and not worried about saving $5. There's no relationship without sacrifice. Church, Jesus sacrificed for us, yet we are reluctant to sacrifice for him. You know what's crazy about Jesus? 
is Jesus said, I want you to live like me and love like me, and then he died for me. That's heavy. I want you to live like me. I want you to love like me. I got it, Jesus. I'm for, and then he goes to the cross. I'm like, oh. I don't know if I was ready for that. See, church, I'm convinced that one of the greatest bottlenecks to breakthrough in our spiritual journey is a lack of sacrifice. See, we want God to open the floodgates of heaven while we're busy cutting corners on earth. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 18. I'm going to just go ahead and get started on it because I want to be... Con- uh, I want to keep track of time this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 18, it says, On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna in Jebus- the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. And when Aruna looked and saw that the king and his officials were coming towards him, he went out and bowed before the king with his face on the ground. Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David responded, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. And Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and here are the the threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Aruna, gives all this to the king. Aruna also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Aruna, no. Listen to this, church. This is important. I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. And David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. I want to let you know it's not a sacrifice if it doesn't cost you anything. And King David goes to make a sacrifice to God. And this man who means perfectly well, there's nothing wrong with the heart of this man. He comes to David and says, King, I want you, this is a good cause. This is worthy. I want you to take anything that you need. I'm not going to charge you a nickel for it. I want you to take the ox, take the land, take whatever you want and give it to God and may God bless you. And how many of us would say, oh, this is the favor of God. I don't have to sacrifice anything for myself because God has provided the sacrifice for me. But David recognizes that's a trap. I'm not cutting a corner when it comes to offering a sacrifice to God. I will not offer something to God that costs me nothing. There is no sacrifice without a cost. And we show up on Sunday feeling like we're bringing God a sacrifice, but what did it cost you? Are you listening this morning, church? What did it cost you? When was the last time you did something for God that cost you something? And I told you that you weren't going to like this message, but when was the last time it's so important for us to grab onto this, that we're not doing the bare minimum, that we're not just offering things to God that come easy, that if we're writing a sermon, that we're not just taking it out of some book we read instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to do a work and a process through us that takes some time, but we're actually coming before God saying, God, put a word in my spirit. God, I want to seek you. God, I want to lay in front of you. God, I want to lift up my this sermon in prayer and ask you to speak into me? When was the last time that when you came before God, you brought him something of worth? When was the last time when you stepped up on the stage to worship him, you've been praying about it for hours before your feet ever touched the carpet? When was the last time when you came in to greet people who were coming in from a world of darkness, who were coming in looking for hope and joy? When was the last time you prayed for them before you met them? When was the last time it cost you something? What does your sacrifice cost? I want to let you know, if you want to know whether or not your gift is a contribution or a sacrifice, there is an important test. There is an important test to know whether or not it was a sacrifice. Does it shock others and you? Does it shock others and you? Does it make you dizzy to think about it? I want to let you know, If the offering basket goes by you and the amount you put in there does not make your booty clench, (laughs) 
it's probably not a sacrifice. <laughs> I'm going to say that one once. We don't need that more than once. You know what I'm talking about. Amen? You know what I mean. When God puts a number in your heart and sweat, are you with me? Me and Ashley, we've always had this thing where we have an understanding with one another. If God puts a number on one of our hearts that the other one is, is just gonna go with it, we don't question it. And that's been completely fine. It's been completely fine. But there was a time where we had a guest speaker here and he was preaching and, and, and Ashley texted me. It was actually when we were in this building before and, and she was down here in the congregation. The stage used to be right there. And I was up in the sound booth, which was actually, there was a hole in the wall right up there. And she was down here. And while I was up there, and she was down here, and the preacher was right there, he asked for a gift for something, an offering for something. And she texted me and said, hey, God put a number on my heart. Is it all right if I give it? And I'm sitting right up there. And I say, yes, babe, whatever God put on your heart. And the number that God put on her heart was $2,000. At the time that she gave that offering, we had $2,030 in our bank account. The next day, I go to Taco Bell. Taco Bell. And I go to buy an 89 cent bean burrito and my card gets declined. We have no money in our bank account because God told my wife to give it all. I was not pleased. <laughs> and I called my wife immediately, what have you done? And I began to sympathize with Adam in Genesis when he said, God, the woman that you gave me... <laughs> And she's like, God told me to give that amount. I was like, you heard wrong. <laughs> God doesn't tell you to give all of it. And I recognize the sinfulness in my heart because my heart was content with contributions but not with sacrifice. And you know what's amazing is once I submitted to God and said, God, I'm wrong and my heart is exceedingly wicked, God brought all of that back and by the end of the month, because I'm like, I don't know how we're going to pay bills. By the end of the month, all of that money was back in our account. And it didn't make sense because we shouldn't have been able, we weren't earning enough for it to be back in our account. But sacrifice opens doors that contributions do not. Are you with me? Sacrifice determines the value of a thing. Aren't you glad that Christ set your value with his blood? You are worth the blood of the only son of God. And he set your value when he died on the cross. What does your sacrifice say about his value? There are two ways that we can sacrifice with our time and with our treasure. What do those two things say about how highly you think of God? See, there's a story in the Bible about a woman that broke an alabaster jar on the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says that it was worth a year's wages. And this woman sacrificed a year's wages because she understood that this king before her would sacrifice eternity's wages. And everybody around her thought that she was crazy. She seemed like a moron to even the disciples. The disciples questioned why she would give something that valuable. But the interesting thing about this woman is that this woman's name was Mary and she was the sister of a man named Lazarus. And she had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And she knew that a year's wages was a small offering for the life of her brother and the eternity that was secured for both of them. Therefore, nothing would ever be good enough, but this was the best that she could do. We have to sacrifice the lesser for the greater. See, if Jesus could come and give his life for me, then I need to be prepared to give my life for him. 
He died so that I could live. Now I need to die so that he can live through me. Luke chapter nine, verse 24 says, if you try to hang on to your life, you're gonna lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. If you're trying to get your way and get your will and you're not willing to lay anything down for God, you're gonna get what only you can get. But if you bring your life and you surrender it to God and you surrender your roadmap to him, you're gonna get what only he can give. Do you want what only you can get or what only he can give? I don't know about you, but I want what only he can give because it's so much better than anything I could ever acquire on my own. It's touched by the supernatural. The Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I find that interesting because there's a passage in Revelation where Jesus is talking to the church and he says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. When we hear that verse, a lot of times we think he's talking to sinners. He's not. He's talking to the church. I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Your treasure's in there. Basically what he's saying is I'm standing at your treasure. I'm knocking. Will you sacrifice? Will you open the door? Will you trust me enough to allow me in the bank vault? And I have a question for you this morning, church. Where is your heart? Where is your treasure? Where is your time? Are you ready to sacrifice those things to God? Are you ready to sacrifice your time to God? Are you ready to sacrifice your opinions to God? Are you ready to sacrifice your hurt to God? Are you ready to sacrifice your flesh to God? Are you ready to sacrifice? We're coming to a close this morning. I'd like to invite the worship team up if they're ready. But if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Can you turn to Romans chapter 12 this morning? Romans chapter 12. Starting in verse 1. It says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Say it with me. Therefore. therefore. What, what does therefore mean? You know what's funny? Like therefore, that's, it sounds to me like we're missing something, doesn't it? That's as if you walked into a conversation and somebody said, as I was saying, and then says something, and you don't know what they were saying. He says, therefore, meaning in light of what I've already spoken to you, but it's the first verse in chapter 12. Maybe we should jump back to chapter 11 for a second. Can we do that real quick? The end of chapter 11, so Romans 11, starting in verse 35, says, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Have you given so much to God that God is now in your debt? Has your sacrifice, has your generosity, has your gift been so much that it's now tipped the scales out of favor of the cross of Christ? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him for, listen to this church, for from him and through him and for him are all things. From him, all that you have is from who? From him. And for who? And through who? So from God, everything that you have has come. And not only from him, but through him. He is the delivery system by which you are blessed. And ultimately, all that you are blessed with is not for you, it's for him. So that relationship that you've been praying for and you've been crying about and you finally got it, that's not even for you, it's for him. God, take my relationship, use my marriage, God, use it. God, the child that I've been on my knees for, praying for, anguishing over, crying out to you for, and you blessed me with, 
And now I'm holding them in my hands, God. This isn't my child, God. This child is from you and through you and for you. So I dedicate him to you, God. Use him. God, the car that I have, I just needed it so bad. And you blessed me with it. My name is on the title, but it's your car. How can I use it to glorify you? How can I sacrifice with it, God? It's, it's from you, and it's for you, and it's to you. Therefore, therefore, once I understand where everything's come from and what the purpose of everything is, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, you got to keep that in mind because when you lose sight of the cross, you lose sight of the necessity for sacrifice. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Everything else falls short. And you can have the most beautiful singing voice in the world. Alex, you got up here and crushed it today with oceans. I thought I was in a Hillsong concert and that's beautiful. But listen to me, church. True and proper worship is being a living sacrifice. So do not conform to the patterns of this world that tells you to treat yourself. Instead, be transformed, become something new by the renewing of your mind. It's not the old mind that you came into church with this morning, it's a new mind and it's a transformed mind. It doesn't think the way that Christy used to think in the past. It doesn't wish the way that Mike used to wish yesterday. It's a new mind and a transformed mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Then you'll be able to know what his roadmap for your life is and you'll be able to follow it. Because if you wanna follow his roadmap for your life, you gotta be ready to sacrifice. You gotta be ready to sacrifice.